We can start talking about proportional reasoning. <laughs> so, we probably all have some intuition about what a proportion is. Um, it's like if we want to talk about, you know, a discipline and we want to discuss a gender imbalance and we say something like, um, this field is heavily skewed towards male students there are eight male students for every one female student, or something like that. So, we talk about proportions when our ratio But we in two quantities is constant. So going up to um Going back to my example, and I'll say up front, I'm making these numbers up. There is a gender imbalance, but I don't know exactly what it is. But say, we're looking at computer science students at a large college. And this large college, again, recognizes that it's got a problem in the sense that one of its disciplines is dominated by men. Again, just making up a number. Maybe they observe that we have a ratio of one woman for every eight men, or something like this. This is called a proportion, assuming that this ratio is more or less constant as time passes. Like one year they might have more students, one year they might have fewer students, so the number of men and the number of women might be changing over time. But if this is a proportion, we um, maintain this ratio. And a proportion is a fraction, and that's often, in my opinion, the most useful way to think of it. Um, but you often see proportions written using notation other than fraction notation. You often see, instead of the horizontal fraction bar, a colon separating the numbers. So let's do an example with this. A uh, class at this university has um, 30 men in about how many women 
does it have? Let's state a question like this. And the key to these questions, again, is that these fractions, these ratios, are constant. At this particular university, that's new, in this particular major, the ratio, the fraction of women to men, is hanging out at around 1 over 8. So if we now take this statement, that M, the number of men, is 30, we get an equality like that with an unknown constant W that we can solve for. And, well, I say that we can solve for, let's make sure we can. Let's make sure we remember how to solve equalities that look like this. There are a few things you could do to solve that equality, but the most standard thing I would say is something called cross multiplication. And cross multiplication says that for two fractions to be equal, this product and this product have to be the same. And you see the lines intersect, hence the phrase cross multiplication. So in this specific case, if W over 30 is going to equal 1 divided by 8. Again, there are multiple ways you could approach this. Um, you could just recognize that you have division on the left, and division is undone by multiplication. So you could just multiply by 30 and not worry about this crossing stuff. But again, the way that gets most often taught is to rewrite that statement about equalities as a statement about numbers. Use that sentence was not what I was trying to say. The most common thing to do is to rewrite the statement about fractions as a statement that does not have fractions using cross multiplication. And then we, we haven't covered the algebra section yet. It's sort of a constant niggle at the back of my mind that this book assumes students know algebra, but that it teaches students algebra later on. But perhaps we know how to solve an equality like this anyway. If we've got multiplication and we want to get rid of it, we can do so via division. And we get W equals, well, some fraction. 8, 16, 24, about 
four. I mean, you can't you can't have a fractional number of women, but let me give an exact answer, which is three and six eighths, <clears throat> and then a squiggly equal sign means is about equal to, is approximately equal to. So bearing in mind that you can't actually have three and six eighths of a woman, we expect that there will be about four women in the class. And proportions are one of these things that you just use in your day-to-day -day life. And a lot of times, and I'll admit this, a lot of times when a math professor tells their students that they're going to use something, they're, they're kind of lying to them. Like you can go through your life and not know how to factor a quadratic. That's just true. But for example, if you ever cook, you need to have some idea of how proportions work. And in particular, you have to understand that when you have a recipe and you see like three teaspoons of, well, that would be one tablespoon of this and half a teaspoon of that, um, those are really proportions. And if you, you know, increase the amount of red pepper by one teaspoon, it doesn't necessarily mean you should also increase the amount of salt by one teaspoon or the amount of black pepper by one teaspoon. Instead, if a recipe calls for one half a teaspoon of Time, let's say, and one red onion. That's really a proportion, you know. If you're living by yourself, you might not want to make the entire recipe, especially if you don't have a refrigerator or if, you know, you're making something that isn't going to heat up well. Or if you're cooking for a party, you might want to make more of the food than the recipe calls for. Let's say you're making this recipe and you're trying to make this recipe out of the scraps you have in your refrigerator. And yesterday, half of your red onion got used as a burger topping, so you only have half a red onion in your refrigerator. So you say, well, I'm using less red onion than the recipe calls for. What should I do with my tie? Which is obviously misspelled, but whatever. Um, well, again, when you have a recipe, what you're really seeing are proportions. For every red onion, you ought to have half a teaspoon of thyme. So if you have fewer than red one red onion, you ought to have fewer than one, fewer than a half a teaspoon thyme. And again, proportions are very frequently and very traditionally written like that, but I think it's almost always easier to think of them in terms of fractions. Here we're going to have 
an improper fraction, thanks to that uh, half a teaspoon. But that fraction represents the proportion. And again, the point of a proportion is that this fraction is constant. So if you change the amount of onion, you have to change the amount of time to keep it constant. We have one half a red onion. and some unknown amount of time, call it x. And that has to equal one over one half. It has to equal that ratio, that fraction. And we'll cross multiply. Again, you could do other things, maybe, but cross multiplication is going to be simpler, I think. Uh, remember, when we're multiplying fractions, we don't need a common denominator or anything like that. We multiply the tops, we multiply the bottoms. So one times one is one. Two times two is four. And that equals one X. And if we had like a three there or a seven or whatever, we'd have to do some division. But since multiplying by one doesn't do anything, There is our ratio, or rather, there's the amount of time. And something I want to say is that when you're writing ratios, it doesn't matter what's on the top or what's on the bottom. I mean, because we're sort of used to fractions having a smaller top than a bottom, I'll often put the smaller number on top. I did not do that here. I just put the one on top. What I'm trying to get at is that you might look at us going from here to there and ask, but why is it one onion over one half five? Why isn't it instead one half time? over one onion. How do I know which is which? And the answer is that it doesn't matter which you use. If we have one half time over one onion, now, when we plug this one half of a red onion in, it's going to plug into the bottom instead of the top. And when we cross multiply, we're still going to end up with one fourth equals one times x, or x equals a fourth. So when you're working with ratios, it doesn't matter what's on the top and what's on the bottom. The only thing that matters is that you're consistent. If I'm putting the time on the top and the onion on the bottom here, then the time has to go on the top and the onion has to go on the bottom over here. 
Um, similar sort of to that, I guess. I mean, most recipes are going to have more than two ingredients. Let's look at Let's look at spite something slightly more intricate. Um, when we talk about modifying recipes, I mean, everything I've said so far is true, but what you normally talk about is like having recipes or doubling recipes. So, you know, another way of looking at this, that's again, keep the idea, that you have half of a red onion when the recipe calls for an entire red onion. So, in a situation like this, the, another way of thinking about this is that the ratio of what you have and what you want is going to be constant. So we want one red onion. That is, that's instead of using want, because that's kind of that's not quite what we're getting at here. The recipe calls for one red onion, and we have half a red onion. Sometimes I just write letters on the board, and I don't know why. So the recipe calls for one red onion. We have one red onion. How should I do this? I'll probably take things over to the right. And I'm talking about the ratio. So the ratio between what the recipe, let's put halves on top. The ratio between what we have and what we want, what the recipe calls for. Well, we have a half, it calls for one. There we go. I got there in the end. Sorry about that. I was having to kind of feel stuff out in my head as I was writing it down. This recipe is, I mean, this ratio is one half. So another way of saying that, again, instead of half, Again, sorry about this. I'm slightly feeling things out. Instead of have, that's right, will you 
want. Because, I mean, we presumably have as much time as we want, and we presumably have as much red pepper as we want. So the question isn't really how much do we have. The question is how much do we want to use in the recipe. Well, if we multiply both sides by the denominator, obviously it's a little wonky. The denominator isn't a number here. The denominator is a unit. But we find that the amount that we will use in the recipe is one half the amount that the recipe calls for. And once we recognize this, we can make all of the modifications extremely quickly. The recipe calls for one bell pepper, so we'll use a half. It calls for a half a teaspoon of thyme, so we'll use a fourth. It calls for an eighth of a teaspoon red pepper, so we'll use a sixteenth. In, in real cooking, you don't always have these perfect ratios, but it's good enough for us. So that's another way of thinking of these ratios. Or, well, it's another way of thinking of this specific problem. And we're still using a ratio here. We're using the fact that that is a ratio. We're just framing it a little differently. Does anybody let me glance through the homework and pick out a problem or two? But does anybody have any questions? Okay, so 10 is, let's do, oh, number 11 still has a typo in it. So um, let me just do number 11 for you, because number 11 is uh, two, two problems without a third together. And the first problem is kind of goofy, but whatever. In the word, Miss Mississippi. What is the ratio of vowels to consonants? As I say, slightly goofy, but um. And slightly ambiguous, it has to be said, because again, when you're talking about ratios, you can put one quantity on the top, you can put another, the other quantity on the bottom, or if you have your ratio, come on, if you have your ratio written like this, you can put whatever on the left, whatever on the right. I'll write this as a fraction and I'll put the number of vowels on top just because it's sort of vowels to consonants. And I call this example kind of goofy, but maybe it's a nice example um, because, well, because it's straightforward or relatively straightforward. How many vowels are in Mississippi? 
uh, here the word for utter, and that is correct, that I is showing up four times. What about consonants? I think I hear the word seven, although my hearing sort of going. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is what I wanted to hear. Let's do also problem 11, because as I said, in problem 11, two things got kind of uh, mixed together. So something that, you know, colleges and schools and so on talk about a lot is student-teacher ratios. The idea that for effective learning to occur, there should not be vastly more students than there are teachers. So at one school, The teacher student ratio is one to thirty. And let's say we decide that's too high. Like, Shadron's doing a lot of accreditation stuff right now. For in some programs, we're just not allowed to have a teacher-student ratio like this. The Higher Ed Commission will come in and say, you cannot call yourself an accredited school unless you get this ratio down. And again, I don't know where that R came from. But let's say we want or we need a 1 to 20 ratio. Well, presumably, um, and let's Let's say how many students we have. Let's say we have 1,200 students. Now, there are, there are only two ways to get that 1 to 20 ratio, and we'll rule out um, reducing the number of students. There aren't very many schools that want to do that. So that leaves hiring more teachers. How many additional teachers Must be higher. And we'll um we'll note that we're asking how many teachers we have to hire, but we won't um it's probably most convenient not to um, approach the problem that way. What's probably most convenient is just to figure out how many total teachers we need. And then we can figure out how many teachers we already have, and we can get to the number of teachers we have to hire via subtraction. So, Let's start by asking a question, which we won't need immediately, but which we'll need by the end of the problem. How 
many teachers do we or does this school, I guess I should say, but do we already have? Well, we're told there's a one to 30 teacher to student ratio. And we're told there are 1,200 students. So to answer the question, how many teachers are there, we will cross multiply. And we get 1,200 equals 30 acts. You have to kind of drop your units when you cross multiply. Otherwise, you get units like teachers times students that are kind of awkward to work with. So we can divide both sides by 30, and we get what? 400 is what I want to say. It's 40. 40. 40. That's, that sounds more like a more realistic number of teachers for a school to have. So we've got 40. Let's keep that in the back of the, our mind and then let's ask ourselves, well, how many teachers do we need? What we want is to have a 20 down there instead of a 30. We still have 1,200 Students, again, um, we do not want to decimate our student population. We don't want that to be the way we get the ratio up or the ratio down. So we need some number of teachers for this ratio to be true cross multiply twelve hundred equals twenty X divide both sides by twenty sixty is correct. Thank you. So we look at the number of teachers we need, and we look at the number of teachers we have, and good luck to this school district is all I can say. Um, we have 40. We need to have 60. So we must hire an additional 20 teachers. And again, uh, I can only wish them luck in, in their endeavor to do that. But um, does anybody have any questions? before I end class and give out the homework. So we, of course, will not be meeting Monday, so I'll get that homework from you uh, Wednesday. I'll also get you back all of the stuff I have. I know it's kind of accumulated a bit. <laughs>